I, I know I've interviewed you a couple of times, but I've never really asked you this question. And that, do you have a favorite scene that you have written for Night of the Living Dead? Do you have a favorite scene that you still watch to this day? I just said, that was really, that was really a good I, one. I don't know. Um, one of the favorite things when we were making the movie was, you know, we were, we were inventing these flesh-eating zombies, which was my idea, by the way. I came up with, and we didn't call them zombies. Not not every zombie is a is a ghoul, you know. Ghouls are flesh eaters, whether they're uh, uh, whether there's <laughs> zombies are real people. But uh, I came up with the idea that the people chasing this girl ought to be uh, dead people and and after human flesh. And it was a, a bit of a process until I came up with that. George Romero. Had written an opening of a story like that. It wasn't in screenplay form, but he didn't know who the who the um, who the chasers were or what they were after until I came up with that idea. And then I kind of we bashed ideas around and and with some other people. But I took all that material and then I rewrote what he wrote and wrote the whole rest of the script myself. But getting back to the question. Uh, I did not come up with the idea of bringing the brother back. The brother was dead. He hit his head on the tombstone, and that, you know, and, and we assume he's dead. And then somebody, and it wasn't me, said, why doesn't the brother come back and drag Barbara out of the house? Well, we thought that was a good idea, and we debated and debated and debated because we didn't want to blow people's belief in the story, you know, what if, what if they didn't buy it that he could come back? And I said, well, I guess his brain doesn't need to be totally destroyed because he hit his head on a tombstone and let's bring him back. So here's the answer to the question. One of my favorite things was when, you know, we pretty much did our own makeup. I had some help with Carl Hard from Carl Hardman when I, when I was in the, you know, I'm the one that gets a tire iron in the head. And, uh, uh, and Russ did his own makeup for coming back, and, and it just looked great. But I was seeing it in color, of course. I was seeing it live. But he had this bruise coming and blood coming down his nose. It just looked fabulous. And, of course, it worked real well in, in the movie. And uh, Russ kind of thought that out. The first thing we shot was in the cemetery, very first thing in June of uh, 1967. I was only three years old at the time. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so, but we shot the second half of the cemetery. We shot the uh, Bill Heinzman breaking into the car and the car wreck and the girl taking off. We didn't shoot the arrival. So, we're thinking, okay, the brother's going to come back, but you haven't seen him for 90 minutes. Are people going to know who that is that's dragging her out of there? So Russ... Uh, this just in. Here's Tom Savini. Hey, hi, Tom. So um, Grab a seat. Oh, you, have a, you have a friend with you. Have a seat, John. Relax a bit. Oh, yeah, wow. Um, I sit over there at the table. But, just flip uh, it on. Flip it on, Tom. Uh, so... Um, Anyway, so Russ came up with the idea of the driving gloves. He establishes those gloves because they're arriving and he's putting those gloves on and you get a good look at them on purpose because then the first thing you see is that Johnny's glove on that door jam. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. And then he drags her out. So, so i got to ask you, Tom. I've interviewed you quite a few times, but I've never asked this question. And I thought this is a good one. What was it like the first time you saw Night of the Living Dead? How old were you? How did you see it? Because I've never heard, I never heard, I've never heard you know, talk about I've, the first time you saw it. I don't remember. I was in Vietnam when they made the movie. Right. So I didn't see it till I came back. It might have been a drive-in. I, I just don't remember. George Romero asked me that question. And I just, I didn't I know. Think, I think I heard you answer it, but I can't remember what you said. Well, you actually shot a video of me answering it, but uh, <laughs> I think I said the same thing. I just don't remember. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hang on. We're going to bring a microphone over to you. Come on. We've got 
<laughs> he asked you what your favorite horror movie that you made. What was that the question, sir? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, I made? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of hard to beat from dusk till dawn. Because of who I got to hang out with. My job for three days was to watch Selma Hayek do that snake dance. You know? <laughs> you poor me, closer. poor me, right? Can you bring the mic a little closer? Closer? Thank okay. You. I appreciate that. Thank can you. you can you hear okay? Because I was standing back there and yeah. I couldn't understand. Well, yeah, these are these are unidirectional microphones, so you kind of need to. You got to talk like this, okay? Sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. This is Rocky, by the way. I just bought him. <laughs> So if you come and get a selfie with me, Rocky has to be in it. Okay. A redo? Yeah, come on and get a redo. It doesn't look too lively. I just got him 10 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> what so do you want to know? What we have a question right over here. My question is for Tom. Um, what was it like working with Quentin Tarantino? Quentin Tarantino just happens to be a big kid who, who happens to be a genius, you know. Um, there's a few things that happen on a Quentin Tarantino set, okay? No cell phones. Your cell phone goes into a van with your name on it. No cell phones on a Quentin Tarantino set. Also, he'll do <clears throat> like seven takes of something, and he'll make an announcement. He'll say, okay, we're going to do one more. Why? And the whole cast and crew has to chant, because we love making movies. Okay. He'll do that on his set. Also, um, did you see um, Django Unchained? Yes. Okay. Um, there's a scene where uh, the slave is up the tree. Leonardo DiCaprio pulls up and says, shut these dogs up. I can't hear what I'm saying. The guy next to me is supposed to say, get these dogs out of here. But I looked at him, and the, the dogs are attacking him. They've torn his pants off. They bit him on the ass cheek and dragged him to the ground by his ass cheek. His ass looked like Mars, the planet Mars, okay? Now, when I, when I showed up, they gave me a 15-minute lesson with the attack dogs. The guy would say, stand up, turn around, look over. The dog did anything he said, like he understood English. He said, okay, now I'm going to make the dog go crazy, and I want you to hold on to him. So he did this, and the dog dragged me 30 feet into the swamp on my knees. Okay. I couldn't hold him back. You know, eventually, it was like holding back a car. Eventually, I got to hold him, and that's how we did the scene, okay? But my point is uh, what it's like on a Quentin Tarantino set. Oh, I know what it was. So they bring the slave down from the tree and they attach a fake arm to him and the dogs have to tear the arm off. His real arm is behind his back. So they did, I don't know, five or six takes, but you could see the guy's real arm every time and Quentin was getting frustrated. So I did the same thing on Day of the Dead. I, I cut a guy's arm off, but I dug a hole in the ground for the guy's fake a real arm to go into. So all you're aware of is the guy's body. All right, so, so, I said that to Quentin, and I, I didn't want to say anything because K&B was doing the effects, Greg Nicotero, they're my pals, but, but I saw how frustrated Quentin was, and so I, I told him that suggestion. And they did like eight takes, and it worked perfectly. So a few minutes later, Quentin walks by, and he puts something in my hand, and it's five bucks, okay? <laughs> because he said on a Quentin Tarantino set, if, you're, if you solve a problem if your department solves another department's problem, you're the $5 guy, okay? So I, I became the $5 hero. So that's what it's like on a Quentin Tarantino set. What was it like when you first met him? You remember the first time you met him? Oh, I met Quentin Tarantino uh, when he was a kid at a convention. He came up to me and he said, hi, Mr. Savini, I'm a big fan. I work in a video store down the street. I wonder if you, this is LA. I wonder if you would mind coming by and signing some stuff. So I did. This is before he was Quentin Tarantino. And he's hired me five times since then. Because I went to the store and signed stuff, you know, and, and became like a friend, you know. So anyway, long story, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions for John or Tom? Right there, up front. 
Uh, Tom, for you, uh, what was it like working with Bray Wyatt and creating The Fiend, and, and have you uh, helped him since then with his new characters? Yeah, but I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, there's a, I think tonight is SmackDown. They're in Pittsburgh. My assistant will be there. I wish I could tell you what we're doing, but we're not allowed. You're going to have to be surprised when you watch it, okay? But he walks in the room, and he's a mountain of a person, you know. You know he could kill you with one hand if he wanted to, you know, right then and there. Okay, and you have another question for John or Tom, right in the back, that young gentleman in the third row, Mike. Yeah. Well, I'm coming. If you, could, if you could meet him halfway at the end, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so when you say SmackDown, do you mean WWE? Yeah, yeah, tonight. They're in Pittsburgh tonight. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, Jerry Lawler is here, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, The Undertaker is here. Yeah. I have his belt. I should have brought it to get it because he's a big fan of mine. Wow. <laughs> wow. I should get him to sign it. Yeah. Have you done cons with Lawler before? He's yes, uh, in um, Ohio and in New York. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Lawler is my whole reason that I go backstage when the wrestlers are in town, you know, because uh, he was a big fan. So I had something to do with Quentin Tarantino that was fairly important. <laughs> he. When I met him at the Land of the Dead premiere, which is the only time I've seen him in person, George Romero introduced us, and he's, he said, you're the guy that wrote the books. And I said, what books? Because I had done about 15 or 20 novels, and three books on movie making. And he said, the movie making books. So later, we were having a drink at the bar, and he said, you know, I made a movie that I didn't finish. And then I bought your books, and I took notes and made charts, and that's what guided me through my first complete movie, which I guess was Reservoir Dogs. Is that wow. right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we had uh, brought Lawrence Tierney out of retirement to, um, and we had him in my movie Midnight, which I made for dirt cheap because I didn't have any money. Uh, we, we were getting cheated out of all the money for Night of the Living Dead. So uh, I did a movie called Midnight, and Tyranny was in it, and then Quentin saw that and brought, and then he put him in the re Reservoir of Dogs. And I haven't seen Quentin since then. How was it like to work with Lawrence Tyranny? He seemed like a pretty wild guy. Tyranny was, he's very quirky, very intelligent. He's one of the few people who could beat me at left and right in word games. I mean, I'm really good at them, but he was way better. You know, that thing where you come up with words and you each time you hang a stick figure? You oh, put it's Hangman. Hangman. Hang, yeah. Hangman. It's been a long time, but he would after. There's an app for that. And he stayed at my house while we were, uh, we were shooting, and my wife would do his laundry. But if, you, if we went to a restaurant, he would charge straight back to the kitchen to see how it was being <laughs> He'd walk around like he belonged there, and, no, and nobody complained. And the other thing, he could do, he could imitate Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock perfectly. And he used to call down to the set of whatever film they were making and use Hitchcock's voice and get all the actors screwed up and doing goofy stuff. And all after that, he, he would call me now and then, and like especially if he knew... I was going to be in New York, and he'd say, we'll have dinner. But he never paid. I always pay. <laughs> you still have, is your head tattooed? Underneath, yes. Okay, but you grew hair over yeah, yeah. it now. It's a COVID okay. thing. I, I, I got to ask you, though, have you seen Lawrence Tierney's, la either of you, his last film he did called Red? I didn't see it. Okay, <laughs> it's something worth checking. It's one of the last things he did before he died. There was uh, these prank radio, these prank TV, actually they based The Simpsons, um, uh, Bart calling the bar and asking for alcoholic. That's all based on this thing called the tube bar. And this, this guy would, would just harangue poor bartender over and over, and they, they ended up, this guy bootlegged these tapes, they went around the country, and they made a movie called Red. It was the last film Lawrence Tierney did. It's pretty intense, but it's all, they took that all and put that into The Simpsons. We sorry, were, sorry uh, to digress. We were Everybody shooting else? the closing of Midnight, which is just 
lots of action, all kinds of things happening, and we had to shoot it pretty much in one night, and he started telling me things, and I said, Larry, I know exactly what I'm doing, and if you keep giving me advice, we're not going to get finished. <laughs> and, uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want there to be a hole in your movie. Well, there, are any, there aren't, yeah. aren't any holes, it works really well. But he got, I think he, oh. developed, he developed, I was, a, you know, much younger and, you know, hadn't directed many feature films, and he, but he developed a respect for me, and that's why he kept in, in touch. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, we have a question right here. All right, this one's for John and Tom. John, did you ever think that the uh, Night of Living Dead was going to become such an icon and start the zombie movement. And Tom, why did you choose to remake it? It was such a great movie, but I still love your movie. Well, I didn't choose to remake it. Uh, George got financing to remake it. And he told me that, and I thought, well, great, I'll get to create some more zombies for George. He said, no, no, I want you to direct it. So that was a big surprise, you know. Was that, was that, your, first, was that your, your debut directorial? No, I directed three episodes of uh, Tales from the Dark Side yep. before that. That's right. And that's why George hired me, because he liked those episodes. I knew it was going to be a classic. <laughs> I tell people when they come to my table, I, there's a shot of me. I was the zombie who got the tire iron in the head, and I'm wearing a white shirt. And I tell them that, that's why... I, I wore the white shirt because I knew I'd have to have a place to sign autographs. <laughs> well, the interesting I, thing about it, my wife doesn't like anything that I like as far as films go. She was coming back from overseas and she wanted something to watch on the flight. Mm -hmm. She says, oh, I can watch this Night of the Living Dead, which she's never seen. Never seen it. We, I don't talk about this stuff with her. It's a different life. Mm -hmm. She actually said... I was so surprised. What a great movie. No wonder it's a classic. And here's someone that doesn't like the genre, but for as a movie, thought it was just really held up really well. So from a non, you know, horror fan fan, yeah. it really there's just a, goes the, 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 how powerful that film was to this day. There's a fan who got in touch with me on Facebook, and I didn't know anything about what he told me, but he said... Uh, there is a film on Netflix, a documentary, and it's all, it's about black actors. I think Tom and I are going to be in it, this documentary. But, but, but I guess, I don't know if it's another part. Anyway, he said that one of the people in the, in the documentary said uh, that Night of the Living Dead is the most influential movie in history, and he didn't say horror movie, he said any movie. You know, so that, that's a pretty good... So two things, can we quiet the droid? Can we quiet the droid? And we have a question right down here. I, this is for Tom. I just wanted to know about your experience with uh, Creep Show on the Creep Show. <laughs> well, Creep Show is five movies, five short movies, you know. And it was just me and a 17-year-old kid that did all that stuff, you know. That's my masterpiece, Creep Show. You know, that was uh, that was a joy. That was, I mean, it sounds like a lot of work, but when you're having fun, it's not work. And that's what Creep Show felt like to me. Yeah, especially Fluffy. Yeah, that's your favorite Poor creation. Fluffy, yes. There are so much goofy stuff. This is something that none of you know, and it's really weird. And not, Weird stuff happens through the whole, you know, bad stuff happens. Because there's all kind of nuts in the business. Um, but I have a, a Western that I wrote, and it's shooting in Arizona right now. And the producer was supposed to send me my payment for the script. And, his, and he just got done paying $32,000 to a custody attorney and was awarded custody of his two and a half year old daughter and the wife kidnapped her and he's running all over the eastern part of the United States with the United States Marshals right now and they haven't captured her yet all right keep and on the lookout everyone and he hasn't been able to send me any money <laughs> so there's a yeah. reward there's a and there's a question in the back yeah we've got one for you here 
This is for Tom. Um, you worked on both From Dust Till Dawn, the movie and the series. How, was it different working on the two different projects, or was it pretty much the same vibe? Um, no, it wasn't the same vibe. Um, I did six episodes of the third season. Uh, if you're going to watch it, watch episode nine. That's the big swashbuckling, bullwhip, killing zombie uh, episode. But it was a different vibe. You know, season one was the movie, but ten hours long. I don't know what the hell season two was. And season three just goes off on all these tangents. And the, But uh, I'm glad I did it. I got to meet uh, the cast and, and, and again, work for Robert Rodriguez because he produced it. You know, but the vibe was totally different. The movie was... Oh, how can I describe that movie, you know? There's George Clooney, Harvey Keitel, Juliette Lewis. You know, that was, it was, a, it was a joy every day to go hang out with those people. You know? I mean, it was a joy to hang out with the TV series people too, but um, it was, yes, to answer your question, it was a whole different vibe, yeah, movie, TV, yeah. Now, I've got one for you, Tom. Two months ago, I had the honor of being invited to the 23rd anniversary of the Tom Savini school special were you makeup there? effects. Were you there? I was there. I was invited. And are you, the, had, are you the guy that got me sick? What was that? I was I was sick for two weeks after that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the one that Because I shook a thousand hands. <laughs> People were talking at me like, right No, here, I just fist bumped you. Okay. Yeah, but you've had an amazing career, obviously, right? Uh, but... What prompted you to decide to pass on all that knowledge to a whole new generation of makeup artists, some of which might be in the audience here? Are there any of my students in the audience? Oh, look, there's yep. one. Over there? There's a couple, yeah. A couple. Yeah, and they're... prospective students, Oh, yeah. correct? Yeah, that's the Douglas correct. Education that's... Center? Well, the school, if you're interested, is 16 months. It's a degree program, and you make monsters and makeups all day, you know. How much fun is that? Okay. And that's in Pittsburgh? That's in, uh, well, it's south of Pittsburgh okay. in Manesson. Oh, okay. wait, what's the other part of your question? I don't no, mean, that was basically it. What about the, oh, yeah. why did I pass it yeah, on? Yeah, passing on your, your knowledge. Because when I was growing up trying to learn makeup, nobody shared their secrets. Yeah. You had to learn by experimenting. I experimented on myself. I would go to school with half my eyebrows missing, <laughs> nose putty in my hair, you know. <laughs> Then I realized I can make up other people, so it was my friends. And they would go home with like half their head burned off, makeup, yeah. and their parents were like, who did that? Savini, well you can't play with him anymore. Anyway, <laughs> you, couldn't learn, you, couldn't learn, you couldn't learn how to do it, so uh, Dick Smith shared all his information, the greatest makeup artist who ever lived. Mm. So the school for me is a way of passing it on, you know, passing on the information because you couldn't get that information when I was a kid. I wish the school was around when I was trying to learn yeah. it, you know? Anyway. Yeah. How, how old were you when you start tinkering around with? Uh, 11. 11? 11 years old, yeah. Is that I, from watching I, TV and saying, wow, I'd like to do that? No, I saw a movie called Man of a Thousand Faces. Lon Chaney. And that was it, the story of Lon. I have a son named Lon. Correct. You know, so if I started, I'm 76. I started when I was 11. So how long is that? Six, <laughs> 60 years? Yeah, it's a few years. Right. It's a handful. Let's get some more questions. Any more questions for yeah, Tom right or there. John? He's I'll behind, go back and get he's that. He's the right in the middle. Over there. Come on, if you could come out to the aisle, sir. Meet me halfway, and we'll get your question. Oh, I thought he fire was... away. Uh, this is from Mr. Savini. Hello. Your uh, your first movie was Death Dream, if I'm if I'm correct. Yeah. What was it like working with Bob Clark and and your experiences with your first movie there? Well, you know, it was a thrill just to be on the set with a cameraman and makeup crew and props. So uh, it was, to me, it was like a dream come true, you know. And the movie is still pretty good. Is it still called Death Dream? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I just yeah. watched it recently. There's a guy behind the beam right there. I'll get him. So uh, how did you get the job for Death Dream? Um, I was in a bar. I don't drink. No, I don't drink. I was delivering signs to the bar. And there was a guy that looked like Indiana Jones. He had a leather jacket, a fedora. And he was the art director on Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. I know, I know. So the next movie was Death Dream. I showed him my portfolio, which is what I tell my students. Don't go anywhere without your portfolio mm -hmm. so you can prove who the hell you are and what you can do. 
You never know when you're going to meet the person who can help or hire you. Go ahead. Oh, I've got one here. Your next okay. question over there, then we'll come over okay. here. Hi. For both of you, do you ever deal with writers or creative blocks, and how do you get out of them? That would be a Jack question. Well, amazingly enough, I don't get writer's block. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, to go back a little bit, when COVID hit, I came back from England at a show convention over there. Everything's going great, except people over there were starting to wear masks. And this is in March of 2020. And I get back to the States, and now COVID's taken off like crazy. I lost all my projects and all my gigs for two and a half years. So what I did, and this is some pretty good advice, Tom, you might even like this. One of the things I did to keep myself going is the University of Pittsburgh bought my archives. I save everything. I think you do too. And they bought all that stuff for $30,000. And then my alma mater, WVU, bought the rest for 20000 so that kind of that helped me get through COVID, but there you are, pretty much stuck in the house and everything's closed. I started writing, you know, you know just kept up writing. Really, I started uh, rewriting things that I had long wa wanted to tweak or or finish, and then I, at, at the end of like right now, I'm still writing. I ended up with eight novels, eight new novels, and they're all being published by Wolfpack Publishing. And Great. so, you know, I, I just never quit. Yeah. So the answer and, to the question is, he doesn't get writer's block. <laughs> yeah, and, but, uh, and, but, never, and never quit. But, we have a question right on the other side of the room here. Okay. Uh, this is for Tom. Uh, my father-in-law is from Bloomfield, and he tells stories all the time about the haunted houses you would do as a child and everything. Uh, and if I remember correctly, you also did something in Century 3 Chevy Mall years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, would you ever consider doing something like that again? Um, like even in Bloomfield for just the kids there? Or? They kind of know that if they come near my house, there's a 12-foot skeleton right there now, you know. Um, but my house is the haunted house for kids, you know, uh, sometimes. But no, it's, it costs a lot of money. And it's, uh, I mean, we did it for 10 years, and we wound up at Century 3 Mall with it. And people don't want to go to a mall for a haunted house. They want a, a prison or a farmhouse or something. So 1,500 less people came. But no, I don't think, uh, it would take a lot for me to do another one, yeah. It's just a lot of work, yeah. Well, got, I thought you raised your hand. Yeah, I got time for a couple more questions. Over here. Right back there, and right over here. I'll get this one while you're walking back. Question on this side of the room. Tom, whatever got you started in the horror industry? Did you love like horror as a kid, or did you just wake up one day and say, "Hey, oh, oh this is cool. I want to do it." No, no, it was the movie Man of a Thousand Faces. Before that, I thought everything was real. Frankenstein, the Wolfman, they were real, and that's the sad thing about it because once you get behind the scenes, that magic is gone. I wish I could see a movie again through the eyes of a ten-year-old child that believes it all. Now, it is replaced by a new magic, the magic of creativity. And there's a lot of joy in that, the joy of uh, giving life to something that never existed before until you decided to make it exist. That's what happens to my students show up. They've never sculpted before. You put a blob of clay in front of them, and suddenly there's this creature that they didn't know they had inside them. So the joy of creativity. But it was that movie that got me started, and uh, it scared me so bad when I was a kid. I decided I want to be the guy who scares people, and I'm still doing it, you know. Well, there's more to the answer than Tom thinks. <laughs> because the first part of the answer is that I don't get writer's block. The next issue is why not? And you can only reach that point if you, if you know your art and craft so well. And there's a lot of secrets and things that I've learned over the years that I do teach my students. And so, yeah, personally, when, when um, if I'm not writing, I have a concept, I have something I want to do, I know basically, I've worked out who the characters are and what the theme is, and yet I'm not writing quite yet. And there, I always find out that there's some thing that I haven't thought of yet, and it can be something small, 
And when that comes into my mind and welds the pieces together, then I can go, and then I go like wildfire. You know, the novel I'm working on now, I'm 100 pages into it. I only started it a month ago. And I have to, if I say so myself, it's damn good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, question down the middle. We've got time for about two more. Uh, this question is for Tom. Um, I was just curious on how was it working with Corey Taylor of Slipknot and designing his, uh, I think, next to last mask, and um, what, if any, inspiration went behind that design? Well, that was completely his idea, and I get a lot of flack about it. What? Tom Savini made this? Because it's so plain. There's nothing going on, you know, but that's exactly what he wanted. We did a second mask where he came into my studio, and I have, I've got thousands of heads and masks and sculptures, and he picked a little bit of this one, a little bit of that one, and we created a mask, and he's never worn it. That's, that, to me, is like the one that he should be wearing. But what you saw is, uh, you know, his idea. But uh, he was fun. He, well, one day we made a cast of his head, and then we sculpted that mask. So that was a really simple, easy job. And let's grab one more. They're going to be headed back to their tables to sign and hang out. So you know we got all weekend. We got one last question right over there. This Make question is for both of you. Uh, is there ever a time that you had an idea that you thought, man, this is brilliant, and you thought this is going to be the best scene in the movie, and then it was shot down, or you weren't able to fulfill it? Uh, and if so, what was that idea? No, that's never happened. I've, I've got, to, I got to do everything that the, the director wanted or the script wanted, you know. And everything works because you've got take two, you've got take three, you keep doing it until it works. Except anything we tried on Stephen King and Creepshow. I had a tongue that grew plants, couldn't get it to work. We couldn't get the green lenses in his eyes because his reflexes were too. So, and I wanted to impress this guy, you know, it's Stephen King. So that's the only stuff that hasn't worked for me was the stuff on Stephen King and Creepshow. But everything else has worked. And they've not cut anything. Sometimes though, like on Friday the 13th part four, every effect is quick. It's really fast. But the director left them long because he knew they were going to cut stuff. So he made them short so we could dwell on Jason's death sliding down the machete. That's why that scene lasts so long. And it wasn't the, bl the bloody take, you know, the room was red, you know, but he didn't use the bloody take because he was afraid it would be get an, an R rating or something. But uh, yeah, I, I was lucky. I, I get away with everything. I actually made a, a film with my students when I had a workshop out of WRS Motion Picture Lab, and it was called 1900 Vampire. And it, these thugs who rob a bank and kill a whole bunch of people see an ad for a phone number and these beautiful sexy women and they decide to go there and they and it's in a funeral home and they're vampires and I I had uh, I don't know if you know Isazu Emilio Cronacchione runs it anyway it's one of the best salons around here so I call Emilio because he has all these beautiful girls working for him he sends three of them out in the vampire, and when they had the vampire teeth in their mouths, they couldn't talk. <laughs> so that really, and by that time, we have a whole bunch of the things shot. It was only a 20 minute short that the students got a chance to, to direct and so on and, and, and be in. And the, I, I, for, I actually had to do some of the spooky voices, kind of voice over, and then make it like it was coming from them. Because they become they become kind of demonic. That's one thing I can think of that didn't work. It, more more often things don't get to be done because there is also a lot of short sightedness. People that think they know everything and don't, or people that block the real creativity. You know, be, either because of money or because they really don't belong in the business, and and they plague your whole career. Speaking so, of phone numbers, if you, if you watch Machete, there's a scene where I show up and you can call me. I'm a hitman, and the number is 1-800-HITMAN. If you call that, it's a gay porno site. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do I guess we had to, I got one quick question, though, for you, Tom. One thing I like, like asking you, and that was, why do you think practical effects 
have just kind of outlasted CGI. It just came and went. Because you know when you're looking at CGI that it's somebody at a computer, you know, creating it. J.J. Um, Abrams bragged that he used a lot of practical effects in the new Star Wars movie. The new Evil Dead movie came out, and they were bragging that there's no CGI because there's a collective dislike of CGI. I love it when it's done well. I wish I had it when I was trying to hide an edge or something when I was working, but uh, they haven't mastered some stuff. Plus, if it looks impossible, well, you automatically think it's CGI. The baseball player in Land of the Dead with half her jaw missing, that was a real makeup. But people thought it was CGI because it was so damn good, you know? So that's the problem. Even kids think if it's impossible that it's CGI. But again, I love it when it's done well. Well, I'd like to thank you guys for coming out. You're very Doing, welcome. Give it up. Standing ovation. No. Two no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank Two legends you, in the you. horror business, John Russo and Mr. Tom Savini. You can do better than that. Thank all of you. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.